Friends, it is good to be in worship with you this morning. I especially like in that uh, song that we just sang how it says in one of the stanzas, Word of Life, because the word of Scripture brings life and gives life. Remember in the Gospel of John, it starts out with, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, and the Word was with God. With that being said, let's go ahead and jump into our Scripture and our sermon for today. I'm going to begin with kind of a reflection, a question. There are times in life when you might feel, when we all feel at one time or another, that we are searching for something. We, we are looking for a branch of wisdom, a word that can help us feel grounded, something that can help us feel complete, something that can help us feel tethered and safe and, and based in reality. So what do we do, right? Marketing people love this. This is what our culture thrives on. We read the, the latest books on happiness. We might try meditation or a new hobby, maybe see a counselor, someone to talk to, and all of that is good. All of it is needed. We need to be active and alive and have someone with a non-judgmental voice walk with us and talk with us. But what we also need, in addition to all of that, is something that has been tested for thousands of years and is not just the latest fad. Something that we know works from generation to generation. And so in our scripture for today, taken from the book of Proverbs, it portrays God as being personified as a woman standing on a street corner. Listen to these words. The book of Proverbs says, Lady Wisdom goes out in the street and shouts. At the town center, she makes her speech. In the middle of the traffic, she takes her stand. At the busiest corner, she calls out, Simpletons, how long will you wallow in ignorance? Cynics, how long will you feed your cynicism? Idiots, how long will you refuse to learn? I'm not exactly sure how that's translated in the Hebrew, by the way. About face, I can revise your life. Look, I am ready to pour out my spirit on you. I'm ready to tell you all I know. Now, that version of Proverbs is taken from Eugene Peterson's translation of the message, and it's a little more perhaps conversational or contemporary than in the NRSV, but you get the point, right? God personified as lazy, as, um, as, um, personified as Lady Wisdom, is standing on the street corner in a busy street in an intersection calling out to the people. So imagine if you can, in your mind, the busiest street corner you can think of, wherever that is, it's going to be different for everybody else. The image that instantly comes to mind for me is standing in the Bombay train station in uh, India. That is a place like no other where the trains come in. And imagine if you can, wherever you are, a Lady standing in the middle of the intersection saying, pay attention. Let my spirit fall upon you. Know that I have something to give to you. In the scripture, God proclaims that the spirit of God is ready to pour out upon us. In the next chapter of Proverbs, in chapter 2, the scripture says from the voice of God, if you seek my words like silver, so this is God talking to us, if you seek my words like silver and search for understanding as for hidden treasures, then you will find the knowledge of God. In other words, there is truth more precious than gold in the words of the Bible. So this sounds good, right? But sometimes we have a hard time jumping into the Bible. Sometimes we have a hard time figuring out what it all means. It's a different language, different custom, different age, different generation. So what do we do? 
Kathleen Norris has written a number of books, but one of them is called Amazing Grace. And she writes in there one chapter called The Scariest Bible Story Ever. Are you ready? She recalls a conversation that she and her husband had in a local steakhouse. Now, I've met Kathleen before. We had her come one time to a church where I was, and, and she's a, a, a poet, and her husband's a poet. And you know that poets are artists, and artists are just a different breed. And they lived in North Dakota at her mother's old house. And so I can just picture them sitting in this steakhouse talking art and poetry with all of the local ranchers. But anyway, she's in a local steakhouse with an old-timer that she names Arlo. Arlo was, in her words, a descendant of dirt poor, oh, I said North Dakota, it's South Dakota, a descendant of dirt poor homesteading immigrants in western South Dakota. And now, three generations later, Arlo and his extended family have become successful ranchers. But Arlo, as they talk about in the steakhouse conversation dinner, was undergoing chemotherapy, and he was aware that his financial success could not help him cure the cancer completely. So they're sitting there in the steakhouse. If you've ever been in a steakhouse in South Dakota with cowboys, you know what this is like. There's not a lot of words. Arlo began talking about his grandfather, a good Presbyterian in his words. His present to, wedding present to Arlo and to his new bride when they were married was a Bible. Arlo said to Kathleen and to her husband that he admired the Bible because it was mostly an expensive gift bound in white leather with their names and date of their wedding set in gold lettering on the cover. Then he said this to Kathleen. He said, I left it in its box, and it ended up in our bedroom closet. For months afterward, every time we saw my grandpa, he would ask me, how do you like the Bible? My wife had written a thank you note, and we had thanked him in person, but he just couldn't let it go. He'd always ask about it. How do you like that Bible? Finally, years later, Arlo grew curious. And he went to the closet. And he said to Kathleen, well, the joke was on me. I finally took the Bible out of the closet. And I found that Granddad had placed a $20 bill in every book of the well, I can't say the next word, thing. $1,300 in all. And he knew I'd never find it. <laughs> now, why is this a scary Bible story? It's not about the lost interest or accumulated money, right? Or the possibility of lost money. It's a reminder that so easily... We let go of the sacred stories of the past that are passed on from one generation to the next. Stories that can give us wisdom and knowledge in life. So what are we supposed to do? That question keeps on coming back. Are we just supposed to randomly pick up the Bible and open up to a page? I probably wouldn't recommend that, but it has worked for some. In the 4th century, a child named Augustine was born. Now, Augustine's parents didn't or couldn't agree on religion. His mother was a Christian. His father was a pagan. There was some discussion about having Augustine baptized at a young age when it looked like he was fatally ill, but Augustine recovered, and after he recovered, his father just could not agree that he should be baptized. The only thing his parents really agreed on was that Augustine needed an education. So he was a trained scholar, and it took him on a teaching path from his home of North Africa to the cities of Rome and Milan. And Augustine, in his words during these times, pursued the desires of both heart and flesh. But Augustine was miserable. He was miserable about the future. He was miserable about his life. He was miserable that he didn't have a purpose, that he didn't have any meaning. He didn't know what he wanted to do. He was 
successful. Yes, he had finances, yes, but he just didn't have a clear sense of purpose. And he was just kind of at the end of, what am I supposed to do? And he was talking with a friend. And then, as the story goes, while sitting beneath a tree, he heard the voices of children singing a song, a song that they sing, sung often. The song said, as a main chorus, pick it up and read it. Pick it up and read it. So for Augustine, this was a sign from God. He picked up the Bible. He randomly turned to Paul's letter to the Romans, and he read these words. Let us live honorably as in daylight, not in carousing and drunkenness, not in sexual excess and lust, not in quarreling and jealousy. Rather, clothe yourselves with our Savior Jesus Christ and make no provision for the desires of the night. And for Augustine, that did it, right? He changed his life. He gave it all up. He became a priest. He became the world's leading theologian, both during his time and today. He started a religious order. He was one of the premier and still is theologians of the day. So I thought about this, right? Take the Bible, pick it up and read it. And I thought about this morning and I thought, is there anyone here today who in front of everyone would like to be a volunteer and to take the Bible as I hand it to you and flip through it and wherever you land on it, let that be how you determine the rest of your life. Are there any takers? Scott, Brian, no? No takers? Nobody wants to do it? You sure? All right. So what are we supposed to do? What are we supposed to do? How do you find that word? How do you find that wisdom. It seems to me that at the heart of what the scripture for today is saying from the book of Proverbs is that there is a need, a call, an invitation to listen. Lady wisdom, remember, go back to that street corner. Lady wisdom crying out from the middle of the street as everyone hustles by, pleads for the people to listen. They see her, but they don't hear her. So earlier this week, I was crafting this sermon, right? And this happens sometimes with sermon writing. I reached a point where I couldn't think of what to write next. And when this happens, at least for me as a preacher, there, there are two choices. Well, actually, there's three choices. Quit, grind it out, and hope that it works, or go for a walk. So I went for a walk. I went for a walk over to Rockwood Reservation. It's close to my house, and I think of it as my personal labyrinth. And here's why. You can get on these paths that go for a couple miles, and as long as you stay on the trail, there's really no chance of you getting lost at all. You can just zone out and walk, and you know eventually that you'll end back up where you parked. So I went out to Rockwood Reservation, and I had my two companions with me, Daisy and Eva. Daisy is our eight-year-old chocolate lab. Eva is the six-month-old puppy that destroys everything in our house. Anyway, that I take care of, right? We're walking along the path. I'm thinking about this passage. I'm thinking about Lady Wisdom. I'm thinking about what the Scripture is saying for us today, for this morning. And then all of a sudden, it dawns on me, I need to listen. I need to listen. So I start to listen. And I hear this bird talking, carrying on some really extravagant conversation. And I can't see the bird but I can hear the bird. And this reminds me how the other day that I read an article on birding and the fact that it really should be called bird listening, not bird watching, because most birders, it turns out, maybe if you're a birder you know this, most birders identify birds first by sound and not by sight. doesn't sound as nice, though, does it? I'm going to go bird listening today. 
But I listened to that bird, and I thought to myself, has that bird been singing the entire time we have been on this hike, and I just now heard it? How could I miss that beauty? And then I thought about that passage where Jesus compares the spiritual life, the spiritual walk to the birds in the air. And Jesus says, don't worry about tomorrow. Tomorrow has enough worries on its own. The birds of the air do not worry. And look at how their father takes care of them and provides. So a little while later, we're nearing the end of our walk. And it's been glorious. It's been refreshing. It was like the one sunny, rainless day so far of this very brief spring spring and the dogs are thirsty and so we stop at this fresh flowing creek and I think to myself okay this is fresh flowing water it's going pretty quickly that probably means there's not giardia so it won't cost me a trip to the vets if the dogs drink the water here and if they do drink the water and get sick I can just say to Paulette I don't know what's wrong with them and anyway let's stop here So we stop here, and the dogs go in the water, and they play around or whatever. But we're standing there, and it's just us and the water and this beautiful, like, 70-degree afternoon. And I listen to the ripples of the water flow gently over these rocks and of this sand. And I think about how it reminds me of the trout streams streams that I like to fish in. And then another passage comes to mind, the passage that comes from the Psalms that says... Like a deer that pants for water, so my soul longs for you, O God. And then all of a sudden, in that moment, all of a sudden, it dawns on me that the words of the Bible, the words of the Bible that I had been preaching on and teaching and learning and leading and loving and struggling and praying for the last 15 years of ordained ministry, they come now more naturally than they did early on. And I'm looking at that stream, and I realize that the words of the Bible are an investment that has paid off over the years. Interest earned on God's Word. So I can't stand here and tell you to read your Bible every day. That seems neither helpful nor nice. But what I can do is tell you this. The words of the Bible, if studied on a regular basis, can give and bring meaning to our lives. I know this in my life. I've seen it in the lives of others. The words of the Bible help me, and they can help you decipher the meanings and the interpretations of life. When I am faced with something, whatever it is, it's not that the the Bible has this book of answers that is complete for everything and I can turn to it right away and say, oh, this is exactly what I'm supposed to do. It's not that. But the Bible serves as a framework, as a guide, as a trusted companion. So my challenge to you this morning is that if you are so inclined, take the time to meditate on the Word of God. And if you pick it up, and if you read it, your entire life might be changed. Thanks be to God. 